Welcome to Candid Catholic Convos, a program brought to you by the Catholic Diocese of Harrisburg. Our mission is to humanize the church and help you to grow in your faith, love, and understanding. I'm your host, Rachel Troche, a cradle Catholic who's only human and struggled with faith on more than one occasion. Each week, you'll hear engaging, down-to-earth interviews and actionable strategies you can implement into your life with ease to help you grow closer to God. If you're ready to open your heart and step fully into the person God created you to be, then you're in the right place. Let's get started. Hello, and thank you for joining me on another episode of Candid Catholic Convos. In the spirit of complete transparency, I need to let you know that the holidays are actually pretty hard for me. Not just hard from a scheduling perspective, but they're hard emotionally as well. Growing up, nearly every major holiday was punctuated by loss, from the death of family members and friends to moving across state lines, job loss, and having to start over. And instead of ever really dealing with those losses, I found ever-evolving ways to distract myself. I have to get the decorations up, or send the cards, or make the cookies, and do we have plans for this weekend yet because so-and-so wants to do something, and if I schedule it just right, I never have to actually deal with anything. What I go through nearly every holiday season is not uncommon at any point in the year. As a society, we are obsessed with productivity, going as far as to attach our worthiness as human beings to the quality of work we produce. We put limits on how long we allow ourselves to grieve or process because it affects our effectiveness as an employee or as productive members of society. For the record, there is no limit on how long you are allowed to grieve, so don't buy into that lie. Productivity is not an effective avoidance mechanism, and it's often very lonely. Trust me, I speak from experience. So with one of the most stressful times of year rapidly approaching, I've invited spiritual director Chris Wood back to the studio for a rundown on how we can process grief and trauma from a position of faith in a world obsessed with productivity. Chris, I'm so excited to have you back talking with us today about a not so pleasant topic, but it's it's always really good to be able to bounce ideas off of somebody else, especially somebody who's, who's walked down the path of grief before. And we talked at length in our last podcast about um, what you've been through and how you've been able to navigate that. So I'm really glad that you're able to share some more knowledge with us today. Yeah, I'm happy to be here. I'm glad to be back. And, you know, this topic is something I have experience with in my life and it's close to my heart. So yeah, I'm very happy to continue the conversation from uh, off of what we talked about last time. When it comes to grief, like when we think about it or when we read the word, we almost always conjure up images of viewings or funerals or death. But in reality, grief is pretty comprehensive, ranging from physiological to spiritual to emotional responses anytime we have any kind of devastating loss in our lives. So what are some ways that grief can manifest in our lives and, and how can we recognize it? So grief is different for everybody depending on who they are and what they've been through. So it's kind of a spectrum of how it affects people. But grief in general is going to come through. It's tricky because sometimes it doesn't come through in the moment, right? Like we're very good as humans in distracting ourselves or occupying ourselves, right? Like a lot of times, um, one of the ways that people deal with grief is just by getting as busy as they possibly can. I know that because I was guilty of that in my life um, with things. And you want to do things and fix things, but at the same time, you're not dealing with your own grief. You're not dealing with the feelings. So it sneaks up on people. You know, we have our moments where we break and where we sort of just crack, just, just fall to it. But, but grief can come through in a lot of ways. And, you know, it's, it is important to remember that it is a psychological thing. It is something that we deal with in our, in our, in our minds and our mental health. So it can come through in any, in any number of ways of just simply just having a moment where we finally break and cry, which can be good for us and a good way to deal with it. But again, I think in today's society, it comes through of like, being busy and trying to hide it and work through it. And that's when I think I have to work through my grief. And like that, 
mean something good, but it can also mean something bad because you don't physically work through your grief. You don't, there, there, you know, there isn't a necessarily set way of dealing with grief, you know? So when it does come up, we have to identify, first of all, what we're grieving and then also just, just take appropriate steps to face those feelings and emotions. But, and again, the way I would put it is, is to deal with them with God and in our prayer lives, as well as the help of others when we deal with the psychological side of these things, you know? So grief comes through mostly obviously in sadness, but also, you know, how we respond to it can be a sign as well, because I think we have a tendency, especially in today's culture, like I said, to want to ignore it or to push it aside or swallow it down deep. So I think that's probably a common symptom is just having that feel. And we all know it. It's kind of a form of anxiety where it's really grief, but it's just because we're swallowing it down. So we kind of feel the same knot in our stomach that we may feel that we associate with anxiety or stress, but really we're just not dealing with whatever it is we're grieving. And like you said, when we talk about grief, we think about somebody's died, right? You're grieving the loss of someone or something, but that's not the only time we deal with grief. You know, we can, we can grieve the unexpected, you know, we can grieve fear, you know, the fear of anything. Somebody doesn't have to die for, for example, my grandmother last night fell down and broke her hip. She's not dead. She's not dying, but she's in pain. She's scared. She has dementia. So that makes it more complicated because she's confused. And I'm grieving that. I'm grieving for her. Again, she's not dead. Uh, doesn't think, doesn't, don't think she's going to die from this. Like it's, you know, she'll get surgery and rehab and stuff like that. But there is a level of grief there as well. And again, my thought at first is, well, what can I do to help? And there's not a lot I can do to help. But what I can do is pray for her and allow myself to feel sad which is just gives me even more inspiration to pray and be present whatever way I can, which is another way that I can deal with the grief. That's a really good point in that sometimes we might not recognize that things not going the way that we thought they were going to go or, or things that we were anticipating and didn't quite pan out the way that we thought they would. You're, you're allowed to grieve that you're allowed to feel something. And I think we are conditional, our conditional responses that we, just shove everything down. I'm fine. I'm fine. I'm fine. I don't need help. And then one minor inconvenience can lead to an explosion of like all the emotions, like a, like a volcano. And maybe if we took the time to express it as it was happening and just kind of put a name to it and just recognize that, Hey, we're actually going through something. It's okay to not be okay. It wouldn't turn into a huge situation later. No. And we all need a moment where we, you know, hitting rock bottom isn't necessarily a bad thing because when you're at the bottom, you can only go up, mm -hmm. which is good. But like you said, you're right. If, if we pay attention to our grief as it's happening to us, we can deal with it in small bites as opposed to falling flat on our faces and basically like having some huge moment that could take us a lot longer to recover from. So but again, we live in a society where we, we tend to stuff away the negative emotions, which is dangerous. Right. Like we're afraid that exposing our negative emotions or even just, you know, emotions of sadness is making us a burden or to weak. somebody else. Yeah. yeah weak. Yeah. Weakness. Yeah, absolutely. So we talked about this a little bit, but sometimes when we're processing grief and trauma, it can kind of feel like we're in the Sahara Desert, like God is this ever evading oasis. We're told that God does his best work in the waiting, in those sometimes in those times of spiritual dryness. But what's the difference between spiritual desolation and depression? And how can we differentiate the two? This is a really good question. Depression is a mental illness. It's an aggressive way to say it, but it is. It's it's a mental illness. It's treated with medicine or therapy or both, a lot of times both. It's a problem with your brain. Spiritual desolation is something affecting the spirit. Now, I wouldn't call it a problem. It's not a fun time, but desolations and consolations, the peaks and valleys of our spiritual lives are part of God's plan for us. So a desolation, when you're in a, in a state of desolation spiritually, you're at a low point. Maybe God is silent at that time on purpose 
but that only has the potential for good things to happen for growth, right? Like we talked about, I think a little bit in the last podcast where these hard times in our lives are like God chiseling away at us like we're a statue, right? But it hurts. So we have to have desolation, something that I deal with in spiritual direction in my own direction, as well as is helping other as others as a spiritual director is dealing with uh, this aspect of it, you know, the ups and downs that can happen quickly or for long periods of time. We hear from saints like uh, St. Mother Teresa talking about year, like long, long periods of time of dryness and prayer, you know, and it's, again, it's important to remember in those moments, God is not distancing himself from us. He's not turning his back. That never happens. God's grace and love is like, an, it's just like the never ending light bulb shining down on us. We're the only ones that can get in the way or put up blocks or allow the devil to mess with us in terms of that. But a spiritual des desolation is something God has willed in our lives for the betterment of our souls, or at least it has the potential to be if we allow it and we work through it in our prayer lives and our spiritual lives. It's an opportunity to persevere and to show faith in God, even when you feel like he's not as close to you, even though he is, but maybe he's just being silent in your prayer life. Depression, like I said, is a mental illness. Now, if you suffer with depression, God is allowing that to happen. It's one of the ways, two ways God's will works. He makes things happen directly or he allows things to happen. So if you're struggling with mental illness, God is allowing it to happen for some greater good. But depression is something, like I said, that is a matter of the mind, not the spirit, not the heart. That's a matter of the mind. And the mind has to be treated separately from the spirit. They're linked our mental health and our spiritual health are very much linked, but they have to be treated separately, if that makes sense. It does, kind of like how you wouldn't go to a podiatrist for a heart condition kind of thing. Yes, but again, everything in our body is connected. Right. That's a good example. So like I said, our, our spiritual health and our mental health are connected and they affect each other. But if you have a mental illness, if you have a psychological wound, something that you're dealing with, whether it's not even something that can be treated with medicine, you're just dealing with trauma and it's affecting the way your mind works, which is very normal. You have to treat that with the proper remedies, medications coming from that side of the fence, if you will. Like you have to see a therapist. You might need a psychiatrist. You may need medication. And people tend to forget that or mm -hmm. at least want to ignore that. There's people that want to pray away mental illnesses. And then God has healing for us, but we have to remember that we are the hands and feet of Jesus. So healing comes through people. It's not all just miracles where God snaps his finger and, you know, grandma's cancer disappeared. Those moments, those kind of things that happen at like Lords and stuff, we hear stories of people going and having miraculous healings. Those are awesome and true, but way more healing happens because a person went to the doctor. And that doesn't mean God's not involved. That just means God is working through the talents and the gifts he gives his people. Like my wife, she had through COVID that cancer battle, right? She was not miraculously healed. We didn't go somewhere and, you know, she didn't dip her body in holy water and all of a sudden, poof, it was gone. She had to go through chemo. She had to go through these medicines and treatments and surgery, and she is now healed. She just had another checkup like a couple years out. She's good. Thank God. But also thank the doctors that God created and gave the gift. So it's the same for our mental health. Like a desolation spiritually is sad and it can be depressing for us if we just focus on the negative. But it is not depression. It is not our mental health and it shouldn't be treated the same. And if you're dealing, if somebody is dealing with depression or thinks they are, you have to seek the right help for that, as well as your spiritual side. Because again, they affect each other. So that's why there are actually quite a lot of people who will be in spiritual direction, as well as therapy or seeing a psychiatrist. It's very common. We actually, as spiritual directors in the diocese here, maintains a list of Catholic therapists and psychologists and things like that. So that way you can take care of both sides of that. You know, and you can take care of the psychological and the therapeutic side with people who are also Catholic, which is good because they won't shrug off the spiritual side that's a part of it as well. But they're very different things, but they, like I said, they can tie into each other 
and affect each other, but they need to be treated separately and specifically. Yes. And oof, did that hit home with the, you need to address them as two separate but whole entities because I can't tell you how many times struggling with depression and anxiety that I've heard, well, you just need to pray it away. You mm -hmm. just need to do this. And I think there's the, there's that stigma around seeking help from a therapist or from a doctor and being on medication as a, a like a sign of weakness mm -hmm. that I couldn't handle this on my own. Well, God gave these talents to doctors and to therapists and psychologists and psychiatrists to help you. Like that is their gift. That is their charism is to, to help people who need the help. And if we don't go to them, they mm -hmm. can't use their gifts. So that, that one really hit home. So thank you for sharing that. Another thing we talked about in our last episode was offering up our grief or suffering. And sometimes when you're in the midst of it and you hear, oh, you should just offer it up, it's like one of those things that you just want to like shake your fist at the sky. But there is a deeper meaning to it. Could you expand on why it's important to offer up our suffering as Catholics? Yeah, I'm actually happy to delve back into this. So I w based off what you first said, if anybody walks up to a person in the midst of their suffering and grief and says, you should just offer it up they're making a mistake because giving people wise counsel is only wise when you give it to them when they're ready to hear it. Okay. Part of giving wise counsel is having the wisdom or, or, or getting the wisdom from God to know when to say it to somebody. So if you walk up to somebody in the middle of a funeral and say, you're so sad and grieving, you should offer it up. Like there, that's not the right time to say that. So you have to be smart about that because that does happen a lot. Or even again, I went straight to death. Obviously, we were talking about how not everybody is grieving death. It's grieving and suffering and involved in lots of different things. So, but to get back to the the entire question, offering sacrifices is not something that should be foreign to us as Catholics. It's a huge part of our faith, and it's a huge part of the foundations of our faith. You know, Catholicism, Christianity, was built on the back of Judaism. You know, Judaism was the religion of God up until Jesus dies, died and rose again. That was the religion of God. And that religion of God had a deep and long history of making sacrifices to God. And we still do that today in the Mass. The Mass is a sacrifice. It's why there's an altar. You know, thankfully, we're not sacrificing sheep and goats anymore. But we don't have to do that anymore because the ultimate sacrifice was paid for us in Jesus Christ. He died to save us. And Mass is just us celebrating that and having that sacrifice. It's how we remember that and also obviously receive the Eucharist, the body of Jesus. But we tend to forget that part of it. Like you'd be surprised how many times when we talk about what Mass is to young people, to teens, that they don't even recognize it as like a sacrifice on an altar, which again has deep roots in Jewish tradition. So... The reason why we why sacrifices were made, and I'm by no means an expert in Jewish tradition, um, but you're lifting your prayers up in that sacrifice, right? Like we know the Mass, like I said, is a sacrifice, and in the Mass we are lifting our prayers up. It's a big prayer, right? And a funeral Mass is a big prayer for the soul of the person who's departed. If we think about lifting up our own suffering or which or our own sacrifices in the same way it's the same thing we're elevating our prayer in that way so when you offer up your suffering whatever it is you are just using something that you feel and you're dealing with to literally just help you lift and push up those prayers even more. And we do the same thing with music, right? Like a common thing in praise and worship music is we say that singing is like praying twice, right? That's what I tell the kids when we do praise and worship. You know, it's, it's, it's meant to be like a lifting of our prayers, whatever our intention is. So when you lift up suffering or a sacrifice for another person, you're using that to lift up that prayer for them. And also to help you remember, because one of the most common things is like people fast for... Uh, someone, right? And a lot of times what we fast from is food, which is not bad. It's very common, but like it's good because you feel hungry. So when you're throughout the day, you're feeling that hunger, that desire for food, and you're consciously setting it aside 
you're also in that time remembering whatever it is you're doing it for, or whoever you're doing it for. And the same with our suffering. If you're like, I'm suffering this time of whatever, you're using those feelings to lift up that prayer intention or, for, or, or the prayer for whoever it is. It's just a way of amplifying our prayer and making it more of a part of our life because we're, we're, we're connecting it to something that we're feeling and dealing with. That's a really good way to look at it. I I hadn't heard of that until when I was pregnant with our first child. I remember somebody saying, you know, oh, you should offer up your labor as a prayer for somebody. And I was like, whoa, <laughs> that's intense. Uh, I can see how powerful that would be. But that was kind of the last thing on my mind at the moment. Um, but I I can see how, you know, if if you know that something is coming, that that would be pretty powerful. And even if you realize while you're walking through it, like, you know, obviously walking up to somebody as they're currently dealing with something, that's probably the last thing they want to hear. But when you recognize it, you could intentionally use it for, for betterment. Well, and practice makes perfect as well. So if we get in the habit of practicing fasting for prayer intentions or, or giving up things or, small sufferings right throughout the day like you know if you know you're about to have a difficult day at work or something like that or if you're in the midst of it and you just take a moment because our intentions are what matter in our prayer lives it's it's about intention in a lot of things so if your intention is you're recognizing this sacrifice or this suffering even if it's just you're in traffic and you know you're going to sit there for 30 minutes dead on 83 just waiting those are moments where we can say this stinks but I'm going to accept this suffering for a soul in purgatory or, or whatever, or, or, you know, someone's health needs or, or whatever, something for your kids. That's when you do all that in small ways, again, when you make prayer a regular part of your life, it makes it easier for you to get through the big hard things. So if we make sacrificial, you know, making these sacrifices and lifting them up to God or lifting them up for others in the small ways throughout our lives, then it's easier for us to focus on those in the big times, like when you're in the midst of labor pains, you know, again, that's, you, you may think of that on your own in that moment, as opposed to somebody telling you in the middle of it and you wanting to throw them out the window. <laughs> that was kind of the reaction that I had, but yes, I, that is, and I love the the image of being stuck in, in traffic on 83, like that is such a tangible way to use small sufferings. Like you, the things you don't really think about, like you're going to be in 83, you're going to be stuck mm -hmm. in traffic anyway. Why not yeah. use the time? That's such a great idea. I think within the last few decades, we really kind of attached this sense of worthiness to our productivity when we think we're only as good as the work that we produce and, and vice versa. Um, which can make times that we're struggling with grief or overwhelming emotion and consequently not performing at our best kind of send us into this downward spiral of I'm just not good enough. So what should we do when we find ourselves in a situation like that? Well, today's, yeah, it is a big problem in culture today, especially in this country. I, you know, I can't speak for any other countries because I don't live in them, but I know in the United States, we live in a very productive culture, you know, but that's because there's a distortion as to what we think of as success because we're focusing on worldly success, right? But we as Catholics know that that only matters so much. What matters is our success in getting to know God in this world and living out a life like Christ and working towards, with the help of God, becoming the saints we're called to be. Uh, but again, there are practical things we have to deal with. So I dealt with this uh, when my late wife, Brittany, died. I had a job. I was not in a financial position to take a sabbatical or anything like that. They were, I worked for a small family owned company. I was in retail management and uh, they were very, as generous with me as they could be. But again, it's a small company. I managed a store. I couldn't just disappear for three months and expect to come back and I still have a job. And I also couldn't afford to, like I said, anyway. So you know, I'm, I'm barely two weeks. I'm back in at work because I have to be. Um, but there's also the part that I struggled with, which is also just putting on a brave face. So, you know, we can deal with the practical side of things. It's like it is a struggle in today's society where if you lose a spouse, like there isn't 
extra time allotted for that. Like if you know, there is, there are getting much better and better with maternity and paternity leave now, which is good, but they're not looking at mental health in the same way, um, which hopefully will improve over time. But there is still, and at least what I struggled with in the sense of what you're talking about is I was raised in a very typical, like American dream household, you know, and in, in, in all the good ways, you know, my dad came from not very much, joined the military, started his own business, very successful. My mom went to college, was an elementary school teacher for like 30 years. Like they worked hard and achieved their goals. And I was raised with the same kind of mentality of like, pull yourself up by the bootstraps, get to work, get it done, work hard, which is good in some ways, but bad in others. Because if you, if you subscribe to that, like I did, and I still struggle with, Pulling yourself up by the bootstraps also means shoving the feelings down because if you're sad, depressed, if whatever you're dealing with, you can't deal with those properly at the same time that you're striving to seem to be normal and successful and achieving things because of other people's impressions of you. So it's really sad and, 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 but again, we can deal with it. So I think the answer is finding balance and being willing to sacrifice things that we need to for the sake of our mental and spiritual health in these moments. If I could go back in time, I would still have gone back to work because I had no choice. Like I can't, I had a mortgage, like I just, a carpet, like I couldn't have not done that, but I could have allowed myself to let other people know that I was not good. In my head. We've unfortunately run out of time, but if you'd like to hear the rest of this episode, you can listen to us anytime on Spotify under Candid Catholic Convos, or you can download this episode from our website at hbgdiocese.org. Thank you so much for listening. Our goal at the Diocese of Harrisburg is to walk with you on your faith journey. So if this episode resonated with you in any way, the easiest way to show your appreciation is by sharing this program with your network or by leaving a review on your listening platform. You can also support us financially by making a donation online at hbgdiocese.org slash DAC and clicking the make a donation button. Thanks again, and we'll see you at church on Sunday.